When you pray, God is listening in heaven when you pray. He's just, we read a moment ago that when we come to him, we're to come boldly to the throne of grace. How, how dare we do that? Oh, absolutely we dare. We must because we can Amen. through him. Not us, him. Amen. It's all him. And when you begin to realize that, that it's such a liberty that wakes you up. So church, we left off, I believe, last time in the third argument of our points. There's six of them total. And it was this, that in verses 11 to 13, uh, coming out of the shadows is hearing, uh, is rejoicing. Hearing what God is saying to us is rejoicing. And we saw this. Firstly, in verse 11, we saw that uh, in all that is new. We rejoice in all that is new. For every priest stands ministering daily. Notice the routine. Notice the grind. Every priest, that's generic, stands ministering daily. That's the grind. Offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. Do you hear what he's saying? He's rubbing it in quite strongly. And here's the conclusion. I mean, you can almost see ro a robot, right? This is what we do. This is We stand up, we sit down. We go to the right, we go to the left. Do this, do that. And the Bible says right here, all of the stuff that is mundane, repeatedly, the same sacrifice, accomplishes what? Which can never take away sins. When you come and confess your sins to me, or if you go and confess your sins to a priest, guess what? Your sins are still on you. Oh, oh no. What do you mean? I just came from confession. There's not a man, a woman, a pastor, priest, or pope on earth who can absolve you of your sins and have your sins taken from you by you and I confessing to them. It's not possible. If it was possible, then what's Jesus telling us about in the Bible? See, we get so bound up in the ritualistics of it all that we wind up not only not having the satisfaction of God hearing us, let's be honest, if you live in that kind of a trap, you're not rejoicing. In fact, you're walking a very fine line if at best. No, you need everything to be made new because God is announcing that the old is done away. And then we also learned in verse 12, in all that is finished. But this man, notice it's capital M, this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever. Listen, he doesn't offer up sacrifices forever. By one sacrifice he offered up, forever sat down at the right hand of God. There's a big difference in what I just said a moment ago. If you believe that sacrifices have got to be offered up over and over again for your sins, then you do not know the God of the Bible nor the doctrines of the Bible. What we have as Jesus Christ as our high priest, he offered up one sacrifice and the power of that sacrifice to wash away your sins is so powerful that it lasts forever. You and I will be in heaven and we'll be 10,000 years into it and you'll be just as secure and safe as the day it was you entered in. You will, so I'm, I hope I'm, I, I'm, af, I'm afraid that after 50,000 years I might <laughs> defect. You will not defect. You will have the nature of Jesus Christ himself. You will not have the capability of sin because you've already gone through that here on earth. And having been resurrected and in entrance into eternal life you will have the nature of Christ himself. There'll be no risk in heaven. Finished. Done. And then we saw, in all that ends, in verse 13, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. And this is where we left off, church. So we'll dive into this now. At some point in time, in a real tangible way, it is a fact, if you believe it or not, the enemies of God will be, as it were, his footstool. Think about how humble a footstool is. Do you have a footstool? I don't know if you have a foot. Maybe you have an ottoman. We, we, we make it fancy. <laughs> Pastor Jack, it's called an ottoman. Well, in one part of our house, we have an ottoman. 
And in another part, my chair, we have, I don't know why, I'm just very attracted to it. It's, it's about, uh, it's a, a little wooden stool from about 1860. And uh, we bought it somewhere in the East Coast, brought it home. And it's just perfect for me. I can, I can put my foot on it just enough and read and with, my, with my laptop or whatever it is. This is perfect. It's only about this tall. It, it's, it's like this big of an area. Cute little humble thing. But you know what? I put my foot on it. And it's got to deal with whatever, whatever condition my feet are in. <laughs> it is, my, my feet go on it. That's what it's for. No, you don't use it for anything else. You don't eat on it. That's where your foot goes. According to the Bible, there's going to be a day when the Jesus that is cussed and cursed and rejected, mocked, ridiculed, and scorned, made fun of and hated by this world tonight is coming back. And he's going to come back, the Bible says, in fiery glory. In the great second coming. And the Bible says he's going to punish the inhabitants of the earth when he returns. Did you know that? That the Christ that is coming back in the second coming, the Bible says that he's going to speak one word and the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to be thrown into hell. Think of that. He's going to judge the nations of the earth. Think of that. And by the way, note how relevant the news is today. All of the news regarding the worldwide global hatred of Jews all of a sudden. By the way, I think it's happened all of a sudden because all of a sudden there's been a massive release of some sort of demonic influence in the world. That's okay, don't panic. God knows how to take care of his people. He's waiting for them to call upon them. He's waiting for them to call upon him. and not, They're not doing it yet. Some are. But listen to this. The Bible tells us that in the second coming, not the rapture, but in the second coming when Christ returns, go read later Matthew chapter 25. Note what the criteria is for any mortal that lives through, that makes it through the tribulation period, there'll be a remnant. There'll be a, a few people. I don't mean a few like three. I mean, <laughs> not many. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 25 that the criteria that Jesus uses against the nations after the seven-year tribulation period, he judges those that have survived on how they treated the Jewish people, his people Israel. That will be the criteria for those entering into the millennium. That's not you. That's not me. We will have returned with Christ in the second coming. Go ahead and read later Revelation chapter 19. You'll find yourself in heaven at that time, returning to earth in the second coming. When Christ sets up his throne, he will judge the nations, and the criteria will be, how did you treat my people, the Jews? Wow. That's going to be a day of reckoning. The Bible tells us that when he does that, those who are rejected will be destroyed They'll be taken away to judgment. The Bible speaks about in the valley of Jehoshaphat, blood will flow to the level of a horse's bridle or bit. What is that? Five feet, four feet? So I don't know. That's high enough. People don't, like, people don't think about this. You don't hear sermons much about the second coming of Christ. The Bible says it's the great and terrible day of the wrath of God. People think that, you know, Jesus is going to come back on a surfboard, maybe. No. <laughs> No, he's coming back to a Christ-rejecting age. And the criteria will be, how did they treat Israel? Remarkable. And in that time, and when that time comes, his enemies will become his footstool. I love that. Here's one of the reasons why. Let's look at the, uh, type or the, the uh, definition of enemy uh, here. The word is uh, holding hostility toward another, in this case, God. Do you know anybody? Are you watching right now? Are you listening right now? And you hold hostility toward God. You hate him. Battling against God. Think about right now. Think about Davos. Davos, Switzerland right now. All these Gulfstream jets have flown in all of these global power brokers and almost every single one of them, I think, if you interviewed them, think they themselves are God. George Soros does. He said so. He said, I don't believe in God. 
But if there was a God, I would be him. George Soros. Klaus Schwab. Globalist. Did you see what they said today on the news? I'm getting excited now. I tell you what. I'm getting excited now. Because, listen, follow this through. Um, and this is going to be so politically incorrect. Are you, put your seatbelt on. Let me just tell you right now. Okay. Let's just, let's just do a little uh, woke test here right now. So today, which is, you know, that's way ahead now. I think it's already Thursday there by now. But in Davos, where all the global brokers, the ones that seek to run your life, all the BlackRock people and all of the uh, World Economic Forum people, they're all there. And they're all talking about bringing around a one world economy, a one world uh, family, no, uh, uh, no borders, all one nation. And um, did you see today, and I'll try to show it to you on Sunday. I'll, I'll, I should have gotten the headline. Today, uh, one of the big leaders said, uh, did you see what happened in Iowa? <laughs> so wait, wait, wait. Wait, this guy's from some foreign country. He's in Davos, Switzerland. And with all of the world's most powerful people, today there was a talk, and the guy said, did you see what happened in Iowa? What happened in Iowa? What happened in Iowa has never happened before in human history, in American history. Listen, what happened in Iowa was... Uh, the, it's the Iowa caucus, or it's, in other words, like a primary for the Republican candidates that are running for office. And no one has ever won like Trump won the other day. But watch what happened. It, it was so, it was reported on every news channel because they couldn't avoid it. It was so big <laughs> that even the, even the crazies had to report on it. That what, what happened, immediately the news got to Davos, Switzerland. Why? Because they want to control the world. Absolutely crazy. Listen, when Christ returns, he's going to set up his own politic, and it will be pure righteousness, and he will reign forever, the Bible says. That word goes on to mean opposition to God. Hating, desiring the destruction of another. Again, the target is God. To wish God dead. God gets in the way. Enemies, the enemies of God are those who want him out of the way. Maybe, listen, you've got to be careful. In your life, you may be dreaming about being a Christian, but in reality, you have no idea of even being a real committed Christian because you've got this thing going on in your life, and, it, and God would get in your way. And so you move them off to the side. It's the same thing. You say, I'm, I, are you saying uh, I'm an enemy to, uh, of God? You might be. And you don't even know it. Because you're not, listen, you're not following him. You're resisting him. Jesus said to the religious Pharisees, you resist the Holy Spirit. Your fathers resisted the prophets who were before you. You resist them then, and you resist them now. Tremendous. Enemies. What about enemies? Who are the enemies of God? I'm sure this is an endless question. But I'll put it to you this way. This is what I'm most concerned about in the world that we live in today. Very charismatic people wrapping religion into their charisma. Winsome. I expect deceivers that are enemies of God to be charismatic and winsome. What's the word? Charming. Miracle workers, the Bible tells us. Did you know that? I know it in my head, and I know what I'm saying to you right now is true, because Jesus said it, the apostles said it, it's in the Bible, it's crystal clear. It's not, not a mystery. But i got to tell you something. There's a magnitude of charisma coming that we've not noticed or experienced in our lives before, and there's a level of winsomeness in deceivers that if it wasn't for the Spirit of God, we'd be deceived by them as well. We've never, friends, listen, according to the Bible, we've never experienced deception that is forthcoming. And are you ready? What if it's soon? You say, oh, Jesus is going to come back before that. What if, he's, what if he doesn't come back before that? 
deception in a winsome package. God help us. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Galatians 3, 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Church, what do you think the answer is? Do you receive... Uh, good. <laughs> Are you so foolish... Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made complete or perfect in the flesh? Did you come to faith in Christ, but then now, ever since, somebody got a hold of you, you read a book or two, or you went to some seminary or some seminar, or you you heard that motivational Christian speaker, and ever since then, you've tried to be the best you every day. It's now about you now, being the best you. Be the best you, and it's all about you. Listen, watch out. Paul would say, who has bewitched you? It's not about you being the best you. There's no way that you can get to heaven by being the better you. That's why the thief on the cross is such so wonderful. The guy did nothing right in his entire life. He did everything wrong. He didn't even ask, he didn't even ask Jesus to save him. Did he? Think about it. Now, did he get saved? Yep. But he didn't say, save me, Jesus. What did he say? Can you remember me? When you come back into your glory, I'd like to be remembered. What a sad, sad commentary on this man's life. I'd love to be remembered. (laughs) That's so cute. Jesus took that. It's like, like, okay, I'm going to take that. Tell you what. Today you'll be with me in paradise. So it's going to be more than being remembered. Jesus told that guy, you're going to be alive with me in paradise. And the man believed them. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. You know what? Think about that. That verse seven, Philippians 3.17 should be tattooed on every pastor's chest. Backwards. So when we look in the mirror, that's what we read. <laughs> pastors should be able to say, follow my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Think of that. Wow. For many walk of whom I've told you Often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Notice the difference in ministry life. There are those that you scrutinize, watch and look to and follow their walk so long as they're following Jesus. Didn't Paul the Apostle say, follow me as I follow Christ? Right? That's what he said. He didn't say, follow me no matter what. (laughs) He said, as long as I'm following Christ, you can follow me. And leaders in the church need to be people who can be looked at, and you can conclude, they're on their way to heaven, stuff happens wherever they go, God is moving, let's go, let's go with them. But you always watch out to what's being lived out. More on this. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Luke 12, 35. Jesus said, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. When he would return from the wedding. That when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master When he comes, we'll find them watching. Verse 40, therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Verse 42, who then is the faithful and wise steward, who his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? 
Blessed is that servant whom his master will find him so doing when he comes. Translation, be faithful and be faithfully doing what you're supposed to be faithful to do. Don't get sidetracked. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. Verse 45. But if that servant, listen, if that servant, let me, you, you read the Bible, but let me change it for a second this way. But if that servant, if that Christian, if that pastor, if your friend, whoever it may be, whoever, if it's yourself, says in his heart, notice, he says it in his heart, which means he believes it, but he may not be confessing it. My master delays his coming. His doctrine, her doctrine is, I think we got time to play around a little bit. I'll get, listen, I'm going to goof off and then I'll repent and come back. Do you know what that's called? Two things, actually. Three things. One is stupid, but <laughs> the word I was really going for was antinomianism, which means, listen, I can sin and then ask him to forgive me and I'll be forgiven. Then I'm going to go do it. Guess what? Number two is, God does not forgive sins of what is called sins of the high hand. They're called presumptuous sins. A non-believer thinks like this, who's religious. I can go do that and then pay 20 bucks to the church and I'm, and I'm clean. Oh, this is a deal. I can go whatever I want to do. I can still be the old me. Because there's no new me. But I want to have the ticket to go to heaven. So if I pay 20 bucks to go do this sin, they tell me I got a ticket, I got a ticket. The Bible says God does not forgive that sin. There's no sacrifice attached to that sin. Oh, not, not your sacrifice. There's no blood sacrifice of Christ attached to that Sin, because it's not being repented of. It's not being owned. And so the blood of Jesus isn't there for that. Somebody once said, Jesus did not die to make bad men good. He died to make dead men live. Amen. I like that. That's powerful. Let's keep reading that verse in the middle of verse 45. Notice what happens when he says, oh, I think it's going to be a while before the Lord returns. He begins to beat the male and female servants or treats his, think, his, think of this, his kids, his wife, his employees, just, just starts to eat and drink and be drunk. And the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and on an hour when he's not aware and he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. <laughs> So wait, wait, did he lose his salvation? Nope, he never had it. How do you know? Because somebody with salvation would not have said, my Lord delays his return. Are you hearing me? One of the great expectancies of the believer is the believer's expectancy that they could meet Jesus at any moment. It's the thrill. When you're in love with somebody, you can't wait to see them again, even if you saw them 10 minutes ago. We haven't even seen Jesus yet and we love him. Think of that. We are a weird group of people, people. <laughs> Think about it. No wonder why the world thinks we're nuts. How can they love somebody they've never met? That's a great question. But then we can all respond by saying, makes sense to me, but the answer is this, and you're not going to believe it, but I met him inside here. Amen. He came and knocked down the door of my heart and invaded me Amen. and took over. He just knocked and knocked and knocked until he knocked it down. Persistent he is, isn't he? Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship, our politic, that's the word, is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you eagerly wait? Or does the thought of him coming back tonight, oh, I'm sure the... As soon as I, 
I was going to, I'm going to say what I'm going to say, but I just paused for a moment because I'm starting to get uh, infiltrated in my thinking by all of the uh, imposters and hacks that are taking our sermons and manipulating them. And you won't believe what's going on, people. I'm t- I've been telling you lately, it's 10 times worse since the last time I brought it up. And now they're using AI. It's incredible. Look, if you see me robbing a bank in M- Miami, it's not me. Okay? Um, if I'm preaching a message on the top of the Eiffel Tower and then I jump off with no parachute, it, it, it's not me. Okay? There's just insanity going out there, okay? And, uh, brother, when I look, people will send me, is this you? And no, it's not me. And there's 10,000 people following this fake person who's been asking them for money. It's so bad. And, and then they take uh, audio, they mix, they change up the sentence around. So, but here it is. I tell you now, because I'm going to say the truth even if they're going to play with it. Okay, let them wind up in, in uh, Hades with all the... <laughs> but are you eagerly waiting for Jesus to the point that, listen, to the point that if he comes back, and here's the part I was, talk, I was warning you about. If he's going to come back at 8 p.m., well, he would have been late. It's past 8. <laughs> he's late, four minutes. If he's, if he's going to come back at 9 p.m. tonight, how, what does that do to you? Think about it. If, it's, if, if, you, if somebody said, he's coming back at 9 o'clock tonight. If you go, oh, crud, what do I do? You're in trouble. If you say, wow, awesome. Um, hey, everybody, get ready. Woo! But if you're like, huh, what, waved what? Uh, really? You're not ready. If you're eagerly waiting for his return, you cannot, you will not be terrorized at that thought. Does that make sense? Think about it. You got to think that through. I don't care. So, excuse me, Pastor, I just graduated with my PhD from this, from Ding Dong Seminary. And we did, that's not what we teach. Yeah, too bad. Too bad you can't get your money back because you were taught wrong. Over and over again. Eagerly waiting, eagerly waiting, watching and waiting. And I'm going to submit to you with all due respect to our brothers and sisters who are martyrs in the world today. I believe it's easier by God's grace to die for him tonight than to live the next 20 years faithful to him every day and every hour, eagerly waiting. Are you hearing me? When it comes time for you and I to die, especially by martyrdom, if that time comes to us, God's grace will overwhelm you. We already know this as a fact from the Bible and from church history. I stood in Oxford University on the X where four great Christian reformers stood there and they were either burned to death at the stake or they were uh, ram- uh, r- driven through by spear. And I forget the one who said, if it was Tyndale or Wycliffe, I don't remember who it was, said, listen, all of you that are watching, if it doesn't hurt, I'll raise my hands and I'll, I'll, pr- I'll start praising the Lord if, if I feel no pain. They light the flames. He's on fire and he's praising the Lord. And all the brothers and sisters saw that going on. And from that moment on, they feared death no longer, no more. God's grace comes. But we equally need God's grace to finish the race. If that race is next week or 10 years from now, we don't know. But I would submit to you, it's hard to be ready every day. And God wants us ready every day. Think of it. Beware of anybody who says, ah, back off. Take a breeze, will you? The Lord delays his return. I'd mark that person. I don't care what PhD they have. PhD. Exactly. (laughs) Piled higher and deeper. It's not necessarily a good thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. You can become educated beyond your intelligence. 
And that's a scary day. You want to have the wisdom of God. And you can, every one of us can have the wisdom of God if we consume the word of God. It's guaranteed. Who are the enemies of God? Those who add or take away from the scripture. Proverbs 30, verse 6. Proverbs 30, verse 6 says, Do not add to his word, lest he rebuke you and you be found to be a liar. 2 Peter chapter 2. You guys okay? Yep. We're not going to finish tonight. Aww. No, look at this. Look at all this stuff. It's just, just, there's no way. I missed the page. We'll go as far as we can. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false prophets among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. Wow. And bringing on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blessing. This is in the context of religion, people. Aren't you glad you came tonight? No, God bless you for coming out on a cold, wintry night like this. All right, I mean, seriously, you came here, you could have stayed home. But you just heard this verse now. The Holy Spirit, according to the command of Jesus, takes this passage of Scripture, you see it, you read it, and puts it in you. You know that's in you now forever, right now. Look at it. Take a good look at that. Read it. It goes into you forever. When some, when some deceiver knocks on your door and starts wooing you with some f- fancy spiritual jargon, remember this. And remember this. Galatians 1, verse 6. Paul says to them, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ. Now, Paul's laying it out there. Are they Christians or are they not? They're at the church at Galatia, but Paul doesn't know if they're believers or not. You won't, listen, people, we won't know if we're true believers or not until we go through trials. I mean, I hate to burst your bubble. I know we're just right in the new year, but here's the thing. You know why? Listen, the world is constantly under temptation and they love it. The Christian's tempted and fights it. When a trial comes, that's altogether different. Temptations are not trials, and trials are not temptations. Temptations come from Satan, my flesh, and this world. Trials come tailor-made by God himself directly to me. Tailor, they're, they, they're, they're, they got my name on it. And the ones that are for you, they have your name on it. So what are you talking about? For me, I don't know. There's fiery trials in life. There's going to be more. For you, I don't know. There has been. There will be more. Why does he do this? To knock, listen, to knock the knowledge that's in your head down 18 inches into your heart. Because there's a lot of people who know a lot of stuff and they'll never make it to heaven. Is that truth in your heart? And only trials put it in your heart. Difficulties. The Bible comes, listen, the Bible comes through in the dark hours. The Bible comes through for you in the difficult times. It's the Bible that works when nothing else does. It's the Bible. And the believer comes out of the fire, glowing, without being consumed. How is that? Your faith is strengthened. I am certain that it is Satan's plan to somehow thwart God's ability to bring to you and I a trial. He doesn't want you to have a trial. Satan doesn't. See, see, you and I, I don't want a trial. Well, nobody wants to sign up. We're humans. But when we say, Lord, have your way with me. God, do whatever you want to make me into the man that you called me to be before you ever laid the foundations of the earth. You know exactly the target, God. In Jesus' name, do that. I'm asking him to not listen to one whimper or whine. When the fire comes, I'm asking him, don't rescue me from it. That's what I'm asking for. Now listen, when my fiery trial, are you hearing me? When my fiery trial comes 
you're going to need to say, Jack, do you remember that Wednesday night you said that? <laughs> listen, he loves you. And you, listen, your faith is going to be purer on the other end of this. And you need to say it to your friends and your husbands and your buddies and your wives and your girlfriends. You got to say it. You got you to encourage them because it's for real. Now, this, is, this gets really dark real quick. I marvel that you are turned away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel. A different gospel? Which is not another. I've had people knock on my door to tell me that they are delivering to me another gospel. They literally say, will you take our book? It's another gospel. Have you, have, you, have you encountered this before? Yeah. <laughs> it's in my Bible. You're standing on the, my front door. You're right here in the Bible. It says, it says there'll be those coming bringing another gospel. You just told me the first one 2,000 years ago failed and God had to send... Another gospel. Well, that's funny. Because that would mean that God doesn't know his own word. It means that he made a mistake somehow. Verse 7 says, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, or from hell, Preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you. Let him be accursed. The word is anathema maranatha. Let him be cast to the deepest hell. As we have said before, verse 9, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be Anathema. Maranatha anathema. May, may he be taken away to the darkest of hell. Wow. You want to know why this is serious business? Because, listen, apparently sins, death, and hell is so bad to God that only his own life and his own blood and his own work could rectify such a horrible thing. And so when you think of sin, oh, it's, just a, it's just a little white lie. It's just a white one. It wasn't a black lie. It was a little white lie. What's the big deal? I only gambled a little bit. I only took a little peek. To God, it is... The thought of it put him on the cross. We look at sin on a scale. What is it? Was that a 10? It was about a 3. How about a 7? That was a 9. <laughs> Not with God. Not with God. He doesn't grade on a curve. Okay. We don't even understand. We don't even, we don't, we don't, for the moment, we don't get how bad sin is. One filthy thought in your mind or my mind put him on the cross. And we, we try to fluff it off. No. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13, for such are false apostles. Did you know there could be false apostles? You ever think of that? Hi, I'm Apostle Jack. <laughs> for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. That's scary. Satan can take on the appearance of an angelic, holy creature. Pretty creepy, right? Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, his ministers, that means Satan's got people in the pulpit. Right? Think about it. Satan has his ministers in his pulpits. That shouldn't surprise us. Don't you think there's spies in the CIA? Right? Don't you think there's spies in the FBI? There's spies. Listen, if, if 
Everything's got spies in it. Satan has spies in the church. Look at this. They can transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. We'll be done with this pretty soon here. We'll end on time. Revelation 22, 18. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life. That is awesome. He's, uh, why is that so awesome? Because you can have your name blotted out of the book of life. But you can't have your name blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. They're two different books. Look them up later. I'll come back to this in ending. I want to show you something. Many of you already know this, but it's, it's cool. From the holy city and from the things which are written in this book, verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. And even if your name's not Shirley, he's coming quickly. <laughs> Surely I'm coming quickly. The word quickly, this is awesome. Put, let's put the uh, Greek up for quickly. This is amazing. You say, wait a minute, Jack. I have a little bone to pick with you. That's Jesus speaking. I see in the book of the Revelation right there that those letters are in red. Surely I come quickly. That's Jesus speaking. Yes, you're correct. Well, he didn't come quickly. It's been 2,000 years. Well, thank God he didn't come back then. Where would we be? No, it's okay. Listen, this is amazing. You always want to read. Whenever you, whenever you come to a Bible verse or a Bible chapter or a Bible section and you're stumped, circle it, mark it down, take some notes, stick some paper in it right there, and uh, come back and visit it a week or two or three or a month later. I'm telling you something. This is very cool. You've got to do this. When you don't get something, does it make sense? Mm, that kind of bothers me. I don't, know, I don't understand. Make some comments on a three-by-five five card. Put it in there, and then watch what happens when you revisit it maybe a few weeks or a month later. You'll be shocked to see how much God has spoken to you from the Bible. Very, very cool. And this is one of those things. The more you dive into the Bible, the louder it speaks. The Word of God is always speaking. Just think right now. There could be a salesman in a hotel in Singapore right now opens the drawer to the hotel uh, nightstand and there's a Gideon Bible there. And maybe the, maybe the, the job, maybe he didn't get the deal. The, he's going to get fired when he gets back to the States. I don't know. I'm making this up right now. But he opens that up and he just ter- opens the Gideon Bible because he's desperate. And he's even thinking about taking his own life. And maybe somebody like what I do, like what you do, you probably get those Gideon Bibles and you go to John chapter 3 and you bend over the page so that it always flops open to that page. And then I have QR codes that have the gospel on them. And I, I have them in every travel thing I have. They're in my backpack, they're in my suitcase, and I just stick them places. And it's just, it's just nothing but a QR code. Didn't say anything on it like, you know, eat at Joe's or... It's just a QR code. I was in Vegas. I was in, ba- I was in a bathroom at a, the Venetian Hotel. And... He, well, so, girls, you won't know this. I don't think. Maybe. I don't know. But in a guy's bathroom when you walk in, if you're going to go into the stall, if the guy comes in and cleans, he cleans this way. You have to sit down and look the other direction. So I just went in there, and I sat down, and I took the QR code and put it on this side of the toilet roll dispenser so that the cleaner guy will never see it. But the guy sits there, and this is in Vegas, and it's a QR code. Oh, I bet you I know what this is. (laughs) And it says, repent and believe. And it, it walks you all the way through the gospel. They're pretty cool. Um, 
how did I get on that? Let's, let's, let's go, let's go here. This Greek word, quickly. Jesus says, behold, surely I come quickly. This is what the word quickly means. To be in a state of waiting. Did you know that Jesus is in a state of waiting? But so are we. It's interesting, huh? Then to be suddenly and quickly set in motion. The Greek word implies that once the moment or movement begins, it will finish soon after its commencement. Listen to this. Here's an illustration. Look at it this way. You're at a track and field event, and you've been waiting all day long to watch your favorite event. It's the 400-meter sprint. But you're not sure when the event will take place on the program. The only thing you know for sure is that the event will take place as part of the track and field meet. Then an announcement is made. The 400-meter sprint is next. The runners take their place. Everyone is in position. And while all, that is the runners and the crowd, are all in a state of waiting, the, the known only to the official, does he fire the, starting, or the starter's gun, and off they go. The entire event begins and ends in 44 and a half seconds. What just happened? The Greek word for Jesus is, behold, I come quickly. It's been 2,000 years and Jesus is waiting. He's waiting. And you're waiting. I'm waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting for the Father to say, go. He's waiting. He's preparing a place for us right now. At some point, the Father... By the way, if you've not seen the documentary Before the Wrath, watch it. Before the Wrath. Go, go on Amazon Prime. Watch it. You'll understand a Galilean wedding like never before. When the sun is building his house on top of his father's house, they build house upon house. It's the father who tells the son, son, it's good. Go get her. And he goes and gets his espoused, engaged bride-to-be. You think about that track and field event. You know the 400's coming. You're waiting. Everybody's waiting. Even the people who are running the 400 are waiting. The announcement is made. Take your positions. Now you see evidence... It's about to start. You're not sure. You're very close because there could be a false start. Something could go wrong. Church, we're in that moment. The runners are in the blocks. And the officials got the pistol, the, the, the starting gun. You almost sense that you can see the tension on the trigger. The anticipation is building for the believer. Every day we wake up in this world now. It's, it wasn't like this five years ago. It wasn't like this 10 years ago. I've been around a long time as a Christian. It wasn't like this 30 years ago. There's something different now. Yes. Behold, I come quickly. The word means wait for it, wait for it. Wait for it. Go! And as soon as it starts, it ends so fast. Think about the culmination, the bulk of the scriptures. Your Bible comprises or covers a seven-year period of time that takes prophets and hundreds of pages of the Bible to cover just seven years on earth. Behold, I come quickly. This is the scripture. And then we have to, we'll end right at this point here. Look at the word footstool. Boy, we didn't get far at all. (laughs) Look at the word footstool. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. 
The word is the resting place for the foot of a sovereign hmm, or a conquering general to place a foot or boot on the neck of a vanquished enemy in a victor's display. Did you know that's what Rome did? That's what they did. They did it publicly. It was a big deal. Listen, many times the Roman generals who were victorious would bring the king or the general of the defeated army that they were fighting. They wouldn't kill them. They would just chain them up and bring them into Rome. Have, have any of you been to Rome at all? Have you, if you've been to the Forum, there's the Arch of Titus. They literally, that stuff, listen, Rome was uh, hardly ever invaded. That stuff's still standing. It's insane. If, if you ever get a chance to go to Rome, um, take the opportunity. And the, you won't have to go very many places. The Forum is unbelievable. And you'll, you'll see reliefs and you'll see uh, legends and, and depictions. And the generals will, would come in. And they would have the conquered king or general that they defeated come before the emperor. So if I were the Roman general who defeated this Persian or this Greek or this, doesn't matter. Bring him in, put him down, watch this. And the general goes like this, right on the guy's neck in front of all of Rome, and the emperor standing there with his boot on his neck. Everybody would basically right, take the picture of that, so to speak, and it means Rome has defeated this empire or this general or this king. And he was, he was either decapitated at that point or served some other purpose for the advancement of the Roman Empire, but he, he met his end. We end where we began. Jesus is coming back someday, friends, and every, everyone who has resisted him must face him. And it's total justice. Everybody's running around screaming, justice, justice, we want justice. <laughs> well, he's bringing justice. Yeah. Trust me, you don't want justice. <laughs> You don't want justice. You want mercy. Yes. You want mercy. Let's stand right now. I'll leave you with this picture. Napoleon was on his conquest. He was on his campaigns. Emperor Napoleon. And word came to him that there was a man in this particular village that was talking down Napoleon was considered a traitor. And Napoleon had him brought to him and Napoleon ordered the man to be beheaded right in front of him. Young man, and his mother comes running out and yells and screams and cries and says, Napoleon, Napoleon, great Napoleon. Please don't kill my son. He says, your son's a traitor. Your son deserves death. She's crying, no, don't do it, don't do it. And he says, I'm Napoleon. I have to, I'm, justice must be. And she says, I'm not, I don't doubt who you are. I understand about justice. I'm not, I'm not debating that with you. I'm asking for your mercy. And Napoleon was moved by that, by the intercession of that mother. Is that a picture of what God has done for us? Amen. Satan, so to speak, has had a boot on your neck all your life. And he tells you, you're mine. You'll always be mine. And that world that you've been brought up in, it'll never be broken. I'm, I, it's, you're going to die the same way. And then you hear about Jesus, and there's a little spark inside your soul. You mean I can know God personally? Yep. You mean that little bit of wondering question inside is real? Yes. Yes. Would he have me? That's what he came for. Amen. He came for you. Amen. 
That's why in this very moment you have ears to hear what's being said. And then the next voice you hear is, God would never have you. His heaven is amazing, and you'd ruin it. What makes you so special? And that the Satan lies like that to you. You hear him in your head. Don't listen to him anymore. When the enemy tries to tell you that you're something not not valuable to God in his salvation. Listen carefully. You need to learn how to agree with Satan. Listen carefully. You need to learn how to agree with him. When Satan says you're a loser, you can say to him, I agree. You're right. I'm a loser. And you're the one who taught me how to be one. (laughs) Is it not true? You're so wicked. Why would God ever want you? Right again. Everything I've done in my life that is wretched, miserable, sinful, and horrific, you taught me how to do it. You're right. But Jesus saves. Thank <laughs> you.